I want to welcome everyone that's, uh, that's come for this joyous occasion. Uh, I uh, speaking to some people during the week. Uh, some people are uh, interested to know more about uh, how it is we come to participate in the Feast of Tabernacles and what is the biblical understanding of the subject of the feasts, which many people today actually believe means famine. <laughs> and it's, it's part of an ongoing story that many of us who were raised in the Advent movement, that the word father actually means not father, and the word son means not son. And so in that same spirit, for many, the word feast means not feast, but famine. And so I would like if we could pray, and then I want to read you something from the Desire of Ages and set the stage for hopefully, hopefully expanding our minds on, on this particular subject. So if we can pray. Father, we want to praise you and thank you that we can come together as your children. We've assembled here to receive a blessing from you. We believe that in gathering on the Sabbath, that you have blessed and sanctified this day with your presence. And so we open our hearts to you that we may be sanctified, that we may be sealed through the, the presence of the Sabbath, the, the sign of the presence of the power of Christ. Lord, I pray that our ears will be attentive and that we will listen carefully to uh, the words that you have to speak to us. Please guide my lips and help me as I speak. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you feel the breeze coming? <laughs> Spirit. The ruach that comes. I, I could take you through what I call a tree-by-tree -tree study of the festivals, which is important to do, but one of the things that I believe the Lord has asked me to do is to provide a setting for truth, to put old light in new settings. And this was one of the, the challenges that we as a church had in 1888, is that the prophet of the Lord said that Jones and Wagner were presenting old light in new settings. And this was difficult for our church. Uh, when you have new wine, you must put it into new wineskins. Uh, and when you see old light in a new setting, it's new wine. It becomes new wine for you. And so, I want to read you something from the Book Desire of Ages, page 287. And this uh, chapter is from the chapter called The Sabbath. So what we're talking about here is in reference to the seventh day Sabbath. Uh, and I would like to uh, again remind us of the journey that many of us have taken that uh, because the truth of the Father and the Son was put in a different context, it was the, the terms father and son were made to serve for the benefit of error rather than for truth. And for many of us, we thought we were worshipping the father and his son, but we weren't. We were seduced into worshipping a false god. And I would like to suggest to you that Satan has done the same thing with the Sabbath. If, it's, if the Sabbath is the mark of Christ's authority, of Christ's power, then isn't Satan going to attack that and cause the very elect to believe that in observing the Sabbath, they are actually engaging in something very futile. And so, uh, this is 287. Notice carefully, I pray that the Spirit will open our ears as we listen. Welcome, Lydia. <laughs> the Saviour had not come to set aside what patriarchs and prophets had spoken. Note carefully, he had not come, at, we know the verse, don't we? I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And to fulfill means to fill it up. Oh, fill it up, fill it up, and let it overflow. That's what it was intended to do. He himself had spoken through these representative men. All the truths of God's word came from him, but these priceless gems had been placed in false settings. Notice 
Notice what she says. Their precious light had been made to minister to error. Think about that. Precious light being made, what it says here, to minister to error. That's a, that's a, that's a challenging concept. The truth can actually be used to minister to error. Uh, and this is, this is something that uh, I would encourage us to think carefully about. Uh, God desired them, uh, desired them to be removed from their settings of error and replaced in a framework of truth. And this is, this is what it's all about. And what I would like to, to look at uh, this morning is try to establish this framework of truth for the Sabbath. So that the Sabbath is not made to minister to error. As it is in many, many places, the Sabbath is made a servant of error because it is set in a wrong setting. And that is because so many people today cannot believe that the Savior did not come to set aside the words of the patriarchs and the prophets. Most Christians believe that he did come to set aside the works of Moses, that he did come to destroy the law and the prophets. This is what so many believe because the framework that has been given causes them to think this way. And I myself have been affected by this type of thinking uh, in uh, my understanding of, of the law of God. The work uh, only a divine hand could accomplish. By its connection with error, the truth has been serving the cause of the enemy of God and man. These are amazing statements. The truth she says, has been serving the cause of the enemy of God and man. That's phenomenal, isn't it? Christ had come to place it where it would glorify God and work the salvation of humanity. Then she says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, the institutions that God has established are for the benefit of mankind. Now this is the first point that I really want to get clear in our minds. Is the Sabbath, was the Sabbath and is the Sabbath designed to be a blessing and a blessing only? Yeah? The Lord blessed the Sabbath day, He sanctified it and He hallowed it to be a blessing. Which, sorry? It was made for man. It was made to be a blessing. So when you hear the word Sabbath in Scripture, you should think blessing. But there are many people when they hear certain words Sabbath in Scripture, they hear cursing. They hear poison. They hear Judaizing. They hear legalism. But the Sabbath was designed to be a blessing. And a blessing only to man. This is, this is the first point. Whether of Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the word, world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ and Christ is God's. The law of Ten Commandments, and notice the sequence here. She's just talked about the Sabbath in its principle. Then she says, the law of Ten Commandments of which the Sabbath forms a part, God gave to his people as a blessing. Then she goes on to say this. The Lord commanded us, said Moses, to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive. Now when she's saying the statutes, what's this talking about? What, what, in Deuteronomy 6.4 when it says uh, to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always. What is this referring to? It's referring to all the institutions that God has instituted in the first five books of Moses. So they were designed to be a blessing. And no, notice when she's talking about the Sabbath, she mentions the Ten Commandments, and then she mentions the statutes. Welcome, Ben. There's plenty down the front here. <laughs> so remember that, remember that connection. Remember that connection. The, the Sabbath... And then she talks about the Ten Commandments, and she talks about the statutes. 
And through the psalmist, the message was given to Israel, Serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. Uh, then she goes on to say on page 288, Wherefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. These words are full of instruction and comfort, because the Sabbath was made for man. It is the Lord's day, it belongs to Christ. And then I encourage you to read the rest of, of that uh, page, but further down it says, Then the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy. Uh, and remember, the key point I'm, I'm wanting to point out here is that the Sabbath needs to be set in a framework of truth. And when it's set in a framework of truth, then all the words of the patriarchs and the prophets will bring us blessing wow. and not cursing. And this is where I, I want to suggest to you where we have a problem in terms of a setting for truth. Uh, and uh, I, I, my attempt to explain a correct setting has come through uh, particularly uh, the books that I've prepared, Life Matters and Identity Wars. I've tried to provide a framework that would allow us to look at uh, these things in a setting, a framework that would in maximize the truth. Now this is just my attempt, it doesn't mean it's the only way, but uh, that's why on the book of, for me, Identity Wars, when you, uh, I need to, I have a copy. The reason I, on this cover I have light streaming into darkness is because when I realized the principles in this book, it was exactly that for me, it was like light streaming into darkness. Now you can say, okay, that's... What are you talking about, Adrian? Let me give you a practical example uh, in reference to what is sin. Let's ask the question in terms of if we have a framework for truth, what is sin? What's the Bible say? Transgression of the law. Okay. So the sin is then a focus on whether we do the right thing or whether we do the wrong thing. Is that correct? Is that all? Sin. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Faith in who? Faith in God. He that cometh to me must believe that he is, and the reward of him that diligently uh, seeks him. Uh, and this is where I have uh, put the two. Oh, that doesn't work. Look at this one. A performance, what I call a performance. Uh, try the third one. Verse a relational that works. Check the other two over this one. When we talk about sin in a performance context, it's a focus on whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, and that's it. It doesn't matter what you're thinking; it just matters what you're doing. But that's, that's not enough, is it? What is sin in a relational context? I want, to, I want to give you a different understanding. It's Romans 8, 7. What does it say? The carnal mind is enmity against who? God. Let's, uh, let's just turn there. Will someone read that for me? I just want to make sure I'm not misquoting. Someone got Romans 8, 7? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Did you see how it says the carnal mind is enmity against God? The, the key focus is God as a person, a relational context, and then is not subject to the law of God. So, in this context... Sin is, as the Spirit of Prophecy says, it's the transgression of the law. It's the outworking of a principle at war with the <laughs> government of God. So sin in this context is something that is hurtful to work towards God. It is something that causes the Son of God to be nailed to a cross. In a performance context, sin is just whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And, and th these are two different frameworks. 
And that's, this is what I've spent a lot of time talking about. Let's have a look at another example. And this is a good one for Seventh-day Adventists. Is it lawful to swim on the Sabbath or not? <laughs> is it lawful to swim on the Sabbath? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Michael. Depends on whether you're saving your life or not. What? Is it a performance context or is it a relational context? Well, Romans 8, 8 says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. So, what is your motivation for swimming on Sabbath? Will it be a blessing if you swim? It's really hot. Will it be a blessing? <laughs> Someone once said to me, God made the water too. It depends on whether you're doing God's pleasure or your pleasure. Whether you're simply seeking to please yourself, a performance focus. In this kingdom, it's either either you do it or you don't do it. That's all there is. In this kingdom, it's am I seeking to glorify my Father? Would it be glorifying our Father to look at beautiful coral? beautiful coral and fish and have your heart overwhelmed with a sense of joy and God's creative power? Uh, and this leads us to another question. When you're walking on the beach, at what level does the water get up your leg that it goes from non-sin to sin? <laughs> I think it's more sin to be looking at what's on the beach sometimes. Well, I, I, I have often said, you know, I, I feel much closer to God out in the water with the dolphins than actually walking in the, on the beach. So, you know, th these are... This is what I'm talking about, putting these questions in a relational context. So when you have Sabbath in a performance context, Sabbath, and, uh, but the people in the world know this about Sabbath keepers. Oh, you're the people that don't do things on Sabbath. That's what they understand in the flesh. They understand you are the people that don't. The Sabbath means that you don't have fun. The Sabbath means that you are boring. The Sabbath means that you can't do anything unless you can get an indulgence from your priest, which we don't have any, so we can't get an indulgence. And so many of us have been actually brought up in this kingdom of understanding the Sabbath. The Sabbath for us has been about a restraint. It has been a, 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 a schoolmaster. Many of us carry the scars of this context for the Sabbath. So that when we read the Ten Commandments, we say, well, it's in the Ten Commandments, it's our obligation to God, we have to do it. But what if this Sabbath experience, someone comes along and says, hey, there's a whole lot more Sabbaths in the Bible. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> no. I, I'm already doing enough, you know. It's like I don't need any more bondage. Uh, I don't need any more um, blessing. <laughs> but in in this kingdom, where the Sabbath is about delighting yourself in the Lord, spending time with your Father and the Lord Jesus, if someone comes along and says, "Would you like more of that?" What are you going to say? Yes. Oh yeah! <laughs> Sign me up. So it's all about context. It's all about context. And that's, that's uh, uh, the key that I want to, to focus on. Now let's, let's talk about, we've looked at, uh, I've mentioned Genesis 2-3, that the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and He hallowed it. How did He bless the Sabbath day? What, do we know anything that He did? He rested. He rested. Now I want you to notice... Uh, Exodus 31.15, if someone can read Exodus 31.15 for me. Six days may work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord, whatever, whatsoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Okay, 
Now, in, in the pattern that I operate, which I, many of you would know I refer to as the divine pattern, the, uh, the Sabbath, Shabbat, uh, Strong's number 7676 is the when. It's the seventh day, the seventh uh, period of time, the seventh day of the week. Something happens on the earth. Some change comes. And what comes is the what. And the what is the rest. It is the rest of God. It is the rest of Christ in the bosom of His Father. That rest, that eternal rest, that as it says in John 1.18, that Christ is in the bosom of His Father, that the secret place of the Most High, that absolute sense of security and blessing and joy, this here is what comes to us on the seventh day Sabbath. Is that, is that right? And what's interesting is that this word here, when you compare, this is, a, um, this is in the Hebrew, Shabbaton, but when you compare it with the Greek, this is the exact word that Jesus used when he said in Matthew 11, 29, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 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 So, does that mean that on the seventh day, if we open our hearts to our Father, by faith, that we will receive Christ in greater measure than any other day of the week? Do we believe this? That, now, th now, this is a big principle that we're taking on board here. Th this flies in the face of most of Christianity. Because most of Christianity will tell you that once Jesus died on the cross, everything was available all the time, anytime. Everything's just, it's all yours. It's all just given to you. And that's why evangelicals, they worship on Sunday, but it doesn't really matter to them. Because it's always available to them. Their belief in the, the grace of Christ is that it, after... After this time, it's just all yours. But as Seventh-day Sabbath keepers, we believe that there is a special blessing reserved for those who open their hearts to God on the seventh day. Don't we? And that, that if you follow that logic through, it leads you in a very, very different direction. Uh, Six Testimonies, page 350. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy says, He that keeps the Sabbath commandment from the heart will keep all the commandments of God. How does that work? How does keeping the Sabbath lead you to keep all the commandments of God? What's the connection? Any idea? Fully surrendered. Fully rest. Fully surrendered. Fully at rest. At rest. And receiving. Receiving His Spirit in, the channel of blessing. in order to reveal all the fullness of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You going to say? Um, I was going to say, um, you are, you're honouring the one who wrote the law by um, keeping So he will give you grace to keep the rest of it. Grace. That's the word I'm looking for. A special grace. Now, the, the Sabbath is, is an example of who Christ is. What, what do we find of the, the Father may have given us all of His blessings individually. We may have just come to Him directly, but He chose to do it a different way. All of His blessings come to us when we accept one individual, His Son. We must choose one above all the others in order to receive any of God's blessings. And it's the same with the Sabbath. We must choose one day above all the others in order to receive all the blessings of God. If you want to keep the commandments of God, then you must open your heart to the Sabbath. And in opening your heart to the Sabbath, you're opening your heart to Christ, who is the only name given among men whereby we might be saved. So, as it says in the book of Hebrews, that Christ was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, so the Sabbath is anointed with the oil of gladness above its fellows, the other six. And so in coming to the Sabbath, we are acknowledging that God works through channels. Uh, and and this, is, this is an important principle to believe this. 
Otherwise, we have to continue to ask ourselves the question, what on earth does the Sabbath have to do with the sealing? If everything is available after the cross, all the time, any time, freely available at any time, the Sabbath is completely irrelevant to your character perfection. Has no, has no significance at all. Just put your hand out, believe in the, what Jesus did on the cross, and that's it. The Sabbath is a completely pointless exercise. Unless you're in a performance space. Sorry? Oh, unless you're... <laughs> True. If, if you're into ticking boxes uh, and uh, using the new sign of circumcision, which is Sabbath keeping, then you will have the idea that you are doing something in order to merit <coughs> salvation. But that is to completely change the meaning of the Sabbath. Okay. All right. Um, I, I also I wanted to mention in passing Ephesians 1.3. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with how many spiritual blessings? Oh. In who? Christ. Christ Jesus. Which means if there's a blessing in the Sabbath, it's come from Christ. That's, that's what it's about. The, the other thing that I want to mention to you is uh, Genesis 3.8. This is really interesting. Because there's, there's a double meaning here. Uh, Genesis 3.8, if someone can read that for us. And I heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So God came walking. Was he with them all the time? Think about it. Was God with Adam and Eve all the time? By his spirit. By his spirit. Yes. But so why would God then walk? This is a really big question. Why would God then walk? with them in the cool of the day if he was with them all the time. Don't forget the cool of the afternoon is not in the original manuscript. I was waiting for you, Ian. <laughs> I was ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> the word is Ruach. Ian taught me that. The word is Ruach. The cool of the day is the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But the point of this is that the Spirit comes in greater measures at different times. That's the whole point of tides. That's the whole point, that God sends His Spirit in greater measure at certain times. You have no need, brethren, that I speak unto you. You know the times and the seasons. And when God sends His Spirit in a greater measure, His children will know when His Spirit comes in greater measure, that they <coughs> have received that greater measure. And so the cool of the day it is is the cool is the refreshing of the spirit. But of course in God's kingdom the, the physical is reflecting the spiritual. And so when that cool wind comes, and when we prayed this morning, I felt that cool wind come in as we began, because we asked God to be with us. Uh, that it's reflective of the Spirit of God moving at a certain time. Ecclesiastes talks about a time for everything. There's a time for everything. And so we know this in so many aspects of our life. It, can you plant a garden any time? Or is, there, is it better to plant at a certain time? There's a time and a season for planting. Yeah. And God is teaching us this in, in many, many different ways. And I, I want you to observe something about the woman of Revelation 12. The woman of Revelation 12 is standing on something. What's she standing on? And what is she clothed in? Sun. Sun. And Genesis chapter 1 in verse uh, 14 to 16 tells us something about the sun and the moon. What do we use the sun and the moon for? One fourteen. if someone can read that. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And then verse 16, it tells us, And God made two great lights. And this is the sun and the moon. Now, it says here that 
uh, they will be for signs and for seasons. And that word seasons is moed, which means appointments. The sun and the moon are for appointments, which means that the woman of Revelation 12 knows her dates, knows her appointments with her beloved. She doesn't turn up to the date that he is set to meet her. She doesn't turn up the next day. Those who turn up the next day are called the five foolish virgins. They don't turn up at the time appointed. And this principle applies again and again and again. The Advent movement was a movement of people that were seeking to understand the appointments of God. That they had to study and understand God's calendar in order to receive the great outpouring. And it's no accident, I would suggest to you, it's no accident that when Samuel Snow came into Exeter, New Hampshire, and he proclaimed October 22nd, 1844, according to the reckoning of the Karaite Jews, that a great movement of the Spirit came in response to that. It's no accident that that happened. Because God moves according to appointed times. His tides, his seasons, everything works according to timing. And we can either choose to run our ship at high tide, or we can try and run it at low tide and see how far we'll get uh, by doing it at low tide, and how much is going to be scraped off the bottom of our soul, on the coral, or on the rocks, or on... God didn't intend for us to navigate life in that way. He intended us to ride upon the high places of the earth. Now, where's that? So Isaiah, what's it in reference to? The Sabbath. <laughs> the Sabbath. There's, there's the principle. There's so much more we could say ab about this. The other thing that I want to speak about timing, and I'm, again, I'm just trying to provide a context and a framework. Uh, and... Uh, then I want to address a few points. I've brought some material for people to read because I'm just wanting to get the correct framework, at least as I understand it. So uh, we read last night, we talked last night about when Moses was instructed to speak to the rock. Uh, the first occasion that this happened was in Exodus 17 when Moses was actually instructed to strike the rock in Exodus 17 and verse 8. What happened when Moses struck the rock. The water came out. What is the symbol of the striking of the rock? Christ being struck. So when the lamb is struck, the water flows out. Do you think that our Father in Heaven has provided a code for us to understand the times when the water would gush out? If we would look in the Bible for when God called for his people to sacrifice a lamb, you will discover the times where the water will gush out in greater measure. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So, 2 Chronicles 8.13. 2 Chronicles 8.13. says, Then Solomon offered burnt offerings under the Lord on the altar of the Lord which he had built before the porch, even after a certain rate every day. So what's this referring to? This is the daily sacrifice. And when did that take place? In the Garden of Eden. Yeah, in the Garden of Eden, but in terms of every day. Morning and evening. So when the lamb is struck, what comes? A blessing. A blessing. A blessing. So morning and evening, and then when else did, when else, when else is the lamb struck? Sabbaths, new moons, solemn feasts. On the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the solemn feasts three times in the year, even in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when the lamb was struck. That's when the water gushes out. If you know that water, spiritual water, is available at these specific times, would it be a good idea to turn up to receive that blessing? Amen. This is, this is uh, 
I find this fascinating. I find it absolutely fascinating in terms of this tells me that the Sabbath is a blessing and a blessing only. Uh, and now uh, there's a, a lot of different places that we could uh, we could go. Uh, and I mentioned this before. Is it a blessing to eat food? If you have a meal that, that is proportionate, is it a blessing? It is. Now, if, if you had one meal in a day, would that be a blessing? <laughs> and then if someone came along and said to you, I am going to provide for you two meals in a day, would that be a greater blessing? Yes. And then if someone said to you, I'm going to give you a third meal in a day, would that be a blessing? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we, get, we come back into this thing here again. There's a lot of people on two meals that are stuck here. I was one of them. Uh, but uh, the principle is the principle of blessing. So if the Lord provides you a Sabbath, is that a blessing? Yes, it is. If He says, well, I will actually, I love you so much, I want to give you more, is that a blessing or a curse? And then He says, look, I can't, I need to give you more. Um, look, let's do it every month as well, on the new moon. Let's get together. It, is that a blessing? Yes. Now you've got every Sabbath, and then you've got well, you've got the morning and the evening. You know that the Spirit of Prophecy, Ella White says, I would be afraid to dwell in the house when they don't have morning and evening worship. Mm. Have, you, have you heard that? Mm. Why? Because a family that's not having morning and evening worship is not going to the well, because the lamb is struck in the morning and the blessing comes out. We want to be there to receive that blessing. And in the evening it's struck again and the blessing comes out. If we're not there to receive it, we're going to become thirsty. We're going to become dry. We're going to become irritated and annoyed at each other. And Satan then is, we're going to grumble and complain. And the serpents will come in. And you don't want to live in a house that's full of serpents, do you? That's why Ellen White said, I, I wouldn't feel safe dwelling in a house where they don't have morning and evening worship. Because it's simply about gathering the water. Another way of looking at this, Rebecca was chosen to be the, the mother uh, of, uh, or the wife of Isaac, the mother of God's people. She had a talent. She could draw water. As God's people, as God's church, as the woman chosen to be the bride of Christ, you must know where and how to draw water to give to God's people. And you can draw water by looking at God's calendar and saying, these are the times when water is going to be more available to you. It's going to be easier for you to draw the water. It's going to be easier for you to uh, uh, take this water and give to other people. And if you don't turn up at those times, it's going to be a lot harder for you. So, um, I, find that, I find that fascinating. Uh, now, we come to old settings, truth being made to serve with error. And this, this comes back to the whole issue of what happened in 1888 and the subject of the covenants. I would like to suggest to you that the Advent movement's understanding of the covenant question caused the truth to make, minister to error. And this is what the 1888 message was about. And I have... I have here uh, uh, a, paper, uh, a paper, maybe we can hand these out. I don't want you to read them now, but just for later on, uh, this, was, this was my, uh, how I dealt with this question of the fact that uh, our pioneers would there be enough, or one maybe between numbers? Between, just one per family. If, if we can pass those out. Some of you may have read this. If you've already read it, then uh, pass it on. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of the, the, the theological background behind this, but suffice to say that... Uh, Pioneer understanding of the covenants was causing them to uh, see many of the aspects of the statutes and the judgments as a problem rather than a blessing. 
But we we have we have an interesting thing in the in in the Adventist Church. Uh, we believe in tithing, don't we? Tithing. Where is tithing written in the Ten Commandments? Where is the tithing written? In the statutes. But if the statutes are nailed to the cross when Jesus died, and this is what many people believe, then why are we doing them? The, the law is about clean and unclean. Is that in the Ten Commandments? <coughs> well, technically, yes. But uh, visually, no. Because the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. Uh, and, and caring for our body is all part of that principle. But that principle then is expanded and manifested in all of the health laws. Uh, and we believe in those health laws. But someone like Uriah Smith, when asked about whether we should appeal to the book of Leviticus to defend why we don't eat unclean meat, he said, we don't want to go there because we will... We will bite off more than we can chew. We'll have more in our hands than we can deal with. And uh, I'm just trying to offer you a bit of uh, a bit of background here. Yeah, yeah. In terms of why the 1888 message was so important, in terms of this understanding of of what happened before the cross and after the cross, it, when God gave all of the the statutes and the judgments to Israel, was he trying to put a noose around their neck and hold them fast and firm and shackled in bondage to keep this stupid human race together long enough to get his son there and fix the problem? Well, that's what many people believe. That's what many people believe. That I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep these people so busy, they won't have time to sit. I'm going to have them sacrificing and doing all this stuff, and they'll be so busy, they won't have time to sing. That's how many people look at it. Uh, yoke of bondage. Uh, but the question is, uh, again, did God... Um, the best way I can express this is, uh, were the patriarchs and the prophets and Moses and Abraham, were they saved by the same gospel that we're saved by, or a different one? The angel that flies in the midst of heaven having the temporary gospel from the time of Christ onwards. The everlasting gospel. This, this, is, this is important that we understand this. And this is why when Jones and Wagner came along, particularly Wagner came along and said, hey, it's the same gospel all the way through. He then opened a door to understanding the statutes and the judgments in a completely different way. Now, I want to I want to read to you, and maybe we can hand some of these out. I don't. Yeah, the same number. Yeah, the same number. Just have a look at some of these, and and in terms of performance and relational model, just a few a few quotes. I'll wait for you to hand these out. Let's have a look at a few of these quotes. Uh, just I want to read the. Uh, particularly the highlighted area. Notice it says, uh, the controversy begun in heaven over the law of God uh, had been kept up upon the earth ever since Satan's expulsion from heaven. The great statute book is truth and truth only, for it delineates with unerring accuracy the history of Satan's deception and the ruin of his followers. Satan claimed to be able to present laws which were better than God's statutes and judgments, and he was expelled from heaven. And note that point carefully. The reason why Satan was thrown out of heaven is because he was wanting to introduce uh, customs and practices at variance with the customs and practices of God. And that's why we have Christmas and Easter and these practices that are at variance with God's practices. He has made a similar attempt upon the earth. Uh, and so that's the first point. Notice that this great controversy is over the law of God and his statutes and his judgments. That's, that's the first point. In the next quote, uh, notice the highlighted area. The words of Moses to Israel concerning the statutes and the judgments of the Lord are also the word of God to us. 
He says, keep therefore and do them. Are you serious? Is she serious here? What? Has she completely missed the gospel? Isn't she saying, worship the Creator? Well, I'm sure she's saying that, but she's saying, the, the words of Moses to Israel concerning the statutes and the judgments of the Lord are the words of God to us. Now, if you're in this framework of performance and you read that, you're either going to start grinding your teeth down, trying to keep and perform and to do all these things, 613 rules and regulations. And while you're trying to do that and you're getting weary of doing that, you'll be seduced into looking at other people. Ah, he's not keeping at least 200 of them. I'm better than him because I'm doing 400. And he's only doing 300. But the problem with that 613, they're forgetting about God's handwritings, which, which was not Moses. Well, they came from God personally. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Um, look at, the, look at uh, the, there's the next one I'm saying. The sacred statutes which Satan has hated and sought to destroy will be honoured throughout a sinless universe. Mm -hmm. Patriarch and Prophets 342. Uh, the next quote is the one I've got for you, Ian. Moses of himself framed no law. Christ, the angel whom God had appointed to go before his chosen people, gave to Moses statutes and requirements necessary to a living religion and to govern the people of God. Christians commit a terrible mistake in calling this law severe and arbitrary and then contrasting it with the gospel and mission of Christ in his ministry on earth as though he were in opposition to the just precepts which they call the law of Moses. That's a, that's a big statement. And that statement right there, I would suggest to you, written in 1875, was an attempt to shift Adventism into a new framework of understanding and to break free of the old framework of understanding which all of our uh, pioneers had been brought up with and educated. And in that document that I gave to you on the, on the, the, the uh, Stand by the Landmarks bill on the platform, I am putting out to you the thought that our pioneers did not break free of the seduction of Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin in their understanding of the covenants. They didn't break free of it. They maintained a framework of understanding the gospel before and after the cross that refused to allow the Sabbath to be proclaimed more fully. Now that's a big mouthful, but I hope that you'll go and study this, and that you'll go and look at this, to see that the commandments of God are not grievous. They are not burdensome. That Jesus, the same, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is the one that spoke to Moses all the things that were given to him. Moses framed no law. Remember that. So when we're talking about the law of Moses, it's the law of Jesus. It's the law of Christ. This is what it is. Moses was just a channel in order to bring this out. Uh, Further on in this same article, in consequence of continual transgression, the moral law was repeated in awful grandeur from Sinai. Christ gave to Moses religious precepts which were to govern everyday life. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. They were not shadowy types to pass away with the death of Christ. They were to be binding upon men in every age time should last. Uh, and just the next quote there. Um, Letter 259-903. Instructions given to Moses for ancient Israels with their sharp, rigid outlines are to be studied and obeyed by the people of God today. Ellen White, you have lost your mind. I hear people say. Do you believe what she's saying here? Sharp, rigid outlines are to be studied and obeyed. Oh, if you're in this kingdom, if you're in the performance kingdom, your flesh is going to scream, No! I'm free in Christ. I don't need all those statutes and judgments and regulations. That's what Satan said in the beginning. Because he wasn't in a relational connection. He wasn't in, no longer in a relationship with Christ. He was a murderer from the beginning. And when he took Christ out of the equation, God's commandments and his statutes be, did become severe and arbitrary because there was no reason to do it from the heart anymore. It was just God imposing himself upon his subjects. 
because Christ was removed from the equation. Now look at the next one. The Saviour said nothing to unsettle the faith in the religion and institutions that had been given through Moses. For real? Is that real? The institutions? Uh, you read Leviticus 23. This shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. The, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the, the, the First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks, the uh, Pe Pentecost, which is Feast of Weeks, the Trumpets, the Atonement. They're all institutions which God gave through Christ, through Moses, in the book of the law. And it says that the Saviour said nothing to unsettle the faith uh, and religion of uh, an institution that had been given through Moses. Uh, and uh, we could we could go on with many other things. Now, quickly, there's just uh, yeah, there's one more. There's a big question you have to answer, and that is, what do you do with Colossians chapter two, verse sixteen to eighteen? If we can, there's a few there. This is going to be the biggest, the biggest challenge. Colossians 2, 16, 18. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink on respect of a new moon, feast day or a Sabbath. Uh, I'm not going to go into that today. If you, if, you read, if you read this, I'm offering to you my understanding of this passage. Uh, Colossians 2.16 for the law of God is the same as 1 John 5.7 to the Trinity. It's the same principle. It's the same principle. It is, it is well, maybe, maybe Matthew 28.19. Matthew 28.19 is read by most people to say, and, uh, in the name of the Father and the, the Son and the Holy Spirit, these three which are one God, that's what most people read when they read that verse, but that's not what it says. It just says, in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. We believe in the Father, Son, and Spirit. We have no problem with that. Uh, even if there is suggestion in history that someone embellished that statement a little bit. It doesn't matter. I don't have any problem with it. Same with Colossians 2.16 to 18. It has been truth in Colossians 2.16, in a wrong framework, has been made the servant of error. It's been made the servant of error because in, of men like... Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, uh, who say that the Old Testament was an era of bondage and the New Testament is an era of grace, freely given, which means the God of the Old Testament had a big problem with people. In the New Testament, he got over it. Thank the Lord for Jesus. Welcome. <laughs> uh, and, and so, I... I would encourage you. <laughs> no, that's all right. Uh, I would encourage you to challenge the the the, the hundreds, the centuries of understanding of the covenants as taught by the Christian Church over the last thousand, uh, fifteen hundred years. Do not accept. The framework, much of the material that has been written has been written simply accepting what has been written by these men over the last 1,500 years. And I'm, I, I am being encouraged to complete the work of the Reformation, to keep reforming and coming back to the commandments of God uh, and, the, to, and the faith of Jesus. And this is, this is the point, again, in the article... Uh, stand by the landmarks and build on the platform. Uh, James White said in the first statement of fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists that we are to keep all the commandments of God. The charter, the direction of the Seventh-day Adventist movement was to seek out to find all the commandments of God and keep them by the faith of Jesus. That's the charter of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. It is not to seek out and find all the commandments of God and destroy them under a framework that everything after the cross is good and everything before the cross is bad. Well, it was good for them, but thank God it's not us. That's, that's the understanding. So, uh, in terms of specific texts, uh, 
regarding there's other questions that need to be addressed in terms of the apostles. If you read the book of Acts and you read the New Testament, you will see plenty of evidence that uh, the apostles kept uh, the Passover, that they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 8, let us therefore keep the feast. It doesn't say let us therefore now reject the feast. It says keep the feast. That's what it says. If you want, uh, those of you who want, and I'll leave these here, this is, uh, this is a little booklet by Elder John Vandenberg that will go into the forest and, uh, and, and take you through past some of the trees on that particular subject. And I, I've just left that there for those who want to read on that subject and get some of the detail on some of these things. I'm trying to show you a bigger picture uh, in terms of the, the issue of the covenants uh, and the framework of the Sabbath. And what, I, what I'm suggesting to the people of God today is that this question is a test for God's people. It's a test. It's a testing truth. It's a present truth. And the test is, do you believe that the Sabbath is a blessing and a blessing only? If you have any lurking desire, uh, feelings or thoughts towards the Sabbath of legalism and Judaizing, if you have any feeling towards the Sabbath in this way, the question of the appointments of God and the feast will expose this. It will reveal it. And that's why it's a testing truth. It will reveal whether you are legalistically performance-minded or whether you are relationally-minded. And I believe God has sent this message to test people. Now, I want to hasten very quickly. There are many, many people that keep the feasts in this kingdom. And I would also suggest to you that keeping the feast in this kingdom would be better for a millstone to be put around their neck and be sunk in the bottom of the sea than to keep the feast in that way. Because then you're stuck in rules and regulations and all of this, you know, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? If you, if you, if you come into the relational kingdom, then these things are only a blessing. They're only a blessing to, to God's people. And they test you as to whether you have, for those of us who have been raised in a Sabbath-keeping environment, whether you have detoxed your performance mindset. Or whether you go, oh, not more rules and regulations. I'm already doing enough. I don't need any more. Whereas in this kingdom, oh, great. I get a whole extra number of days, extra Sabbaths. And my final point on this is uh, I have observed in my journey over the last couple of years, and Igor has he's traveled with me, when there is a multiplication of Sabbaths, there's a great wave that comes through for God's people. And this is a seventh day Sabbath during the Feast of Tabernacles in a Shemitah year, which is a seven year Sabbath, Leviticus 25. This day is a 777 Sabbath. So, all I can say is get a big surfboard and ride this wave today. Because the, the, the water out of the rock is just, it's gushing out of the rock, it's just pouring out. This is pouring out on God's people. Hear the angels singing. They're praising. They're honoring our Father. This is a 777 Sabbath. Paid for by the blood of Christ. It's the only way we can access it. So come to the fountain. Drink freely. The water is fine. Come in. There's no need to be afraid of the feasts of the Lord. Because the word feast does not mean famine. It means feast. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open, I will come into him and feast with him at the appointed times. And it has been my conviction and my uh, belief that in walking in this direction, my mind is being sanctified, my heart is being quickened at a much faster rate than it was before. And that I now can see clearly through these principles that the Sabbath is the sealing message. And the Sabbath is to be proclaimed more fully. And I pray that today, by the grace of God, I have proclaimed to you the Sabbath more fully. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, it is my prayer that your Spirit will bear witness 
with us today, that these things are so. That when you spoke to Moses, Lord Jesus, and you gave these statutes and your judgments, your heart was full of love. You desired to give more of your blessed rest experience. Pour your spirit upon us. Bear witness. And I pray that people here will test, are these things so? Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Leave no stone unturned. Satan will do everything he can to prevent you from obtaining a blessing. But do not submit to him. We pray, Father, that our hearts will be open to all of your blessings. That as the woman that stands on the moon and is clothed in the sun, that we will know your appointments and we will receive of your spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.